Hi, my name is Paul Offit. I'm talking to you today from the Vaccine Education Center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It's Thursday, March 27th, 2025. What I wanted to talk to you today about is measles, which continues to dominate the news and for good reason. We're not used to seeing measles in this country, and I think that's in part why we're so shocked by it. So let's go back a little bit. Um, in 2023, in the United States, we had 58 cases of measles. Last year, in 2024, we had 285 cases of measles. This year, so far, we have a little less than 400 cases of measles um, that has involved about 20 states and jurisdictions. Now, let's talk a little bit about that number, a little less than 400. Is that real? If you look at West Texas, you learn a lot because what happened in West Texas is that there were two children who were admitted to the hospital with measles um, in Lubbock, Texas. Now, that's the first time that the public health community in West Texas knew that there were cases of measles in their community. So when you see that as children being hospitalized, you already know you're seeing the tip of the iceberg because most people with measles aren't hospitalized. Therefore, that that outbreak started sooner than they thought, probably around Thanksgiving or before. Uh, secondly is, are they right about the number of cases, which in West Texas alone is sort of in the mid 300 range, about 350 to 370. And that's probably very low. And the reason is, is that when they say there are, say, 350 confirmed cases, that means that those cases have been confirmed by looking at either PCR analysis from swabs taken from the throat or swabs taken from the nose or serological analysis looking at antibodies in the circulation. Um, so that's what they mean by cases. They mean confirmed cases. But there are a lot of people in that Mennonite community, especially, who don't want people from the outside coming in and doing that kind of testing. So therefore, when you see, say, 350 cases, it's more than that. And what some people in the public health community in West Texas are, are arguing is that there's probably been at least 2,000 cases in West Texas. So that number is low. What's interesting to me is the, the, the need to confirm. I mean, I'm a child of the 1950s. Like all children of the 1950s, I had measles. And the way that was diagnosed was my pediatrician came and visited our home because that's back in the days when pediatricians did home visits. And he looked at me and he examined me. Then he stood up and he looked at my mother and he said, he's got the measles. So how did he know? He knew because I had the classic symptoms. I had the so-called three C's, cough, conjunctivitis, which just means pink eye, and uh, coryza, which just means runny nose. I had a high fever because measles often causes a high fever, sometimes as high as 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I had a rash that started at my hairline and then went down to my face, my trunk, my arms, and my legs. And the name of that rash is it's called a morbilliform rash, which means measles-like because it's fairly classic for measles. And even more importantly, I had these little like grains of sand on the inside of my cheek, so-called coplic spots. That's measles. And so I think it would help actually in these communities when people obviously have measles that they call it a case rather than waiting for serological or PCR confirmation. That would help. The second thing I think um, that's interesting that's going on in uh, West Texas is that according to public health officials, the number of children who are getting MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, is no greater than you would expect at this time anyway. So they're not doing a very good job at getting vaccines into these uh, children who are unvaccinated or undervaccinated. Remember that the, um, the vaccine rate in the Mennonite community is around 82%, which is well less than you need to prevent the spread of measles, which requires really herd immunity around 95%. So we're less than that. The second thing that they're dealing with, aside from the fact that there have been almost 70 children who've been hospitalized with this virus in West Texas, is something called hypervitaminosis A. So unfortunately, um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and others locally have promoted vitamin A as either a prevention for measles or it's perceived as a prevention for measles, whereas the only way to prevent measles is by giving a vaccine or as a treatment for measles. And I think the World Health Organization gets this right. The World Health Organization has said correctly that because there have been studies done in Africa 
showing that you clearly can decrease mortality, death, or you clearly can decrease serious disease by giving two doses of vitamin A on consecutive days at 200,000 international units per dose. There has never been a study in the developed world in countries like the United States to show that vitamin A does prevent uh, mortality. There have been three studies done in the developed world, one in England, one in Italy, one in Japan, that really haven't shown that. Or the one study in, in uh, England was done in 1932. It wasn't randomized, so I don't think we can make much of that study. And that's why the World Health Organization has recommended vitamin A for those countries where you're likely to have vitamin A deficiency. In the United States, the incidence of vitamin A deficiency is probably around 0.3%. So it's rare. Therefore, it's unlikely really to make a difference. Nonetheless, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Foundation for Infectious Disease has that as a recommendation. And I think um, while their argument may be uh, reasonable in the sense that vitamin A is important to, to maintain epithelial cell integrity. So epithelial cells are the cells that line your nose, that line your, line your throat, line your windpipe, line your lungs, and measles can, can destroy those cells. So it's important to have integrity of those cells. And I think they also would argue that, well, I mean, it does seem to work in Africa, so why not here? And we also know that measles um, a virus itself can deplete stores of vitamin A. So, so on its face, the recommendation can arguably make sense, although we are still lacking data that, that this the, a, a strategy of vitamin A has ever worked in the developed world to prevent uh, serious illness. But I think we're seeing now what's happening in West Texas, the downside of that strategy. One is that, that vitamin A is perceived as a preventive or that vitamin A is perceived, perceived as a treatment and therefore they give more and more and more vitamin A. So what they're dealing with now is children who have given too much vitamin A who have things like dizziness, blurry vision, and more importantly, liver damage where they see an elevation of so-called liver function tests showing that there's been some destruction of liver cells. So that's, I think, the downside of that um, recommendation. It is the end of March. Typically, measles um, circulates till about mid-spring, so, so one would expect at least six more weeks of this, although it's hard to know because I think everyone expected that COVID, SARS-CoV-2 virus, would settle into a winter respiratory panel-like influenza, like respiratory syncytial virus, and like other uh, human coronaviruses. That never happened. That virus still circulates throughout the year. I, I don't know what will happen with measles. We would expect it would end around spring, um, but we'll, we'll see. So in any case, um, get vaccinated. The single best way to protect your child against a virus that now is becoming ever more common in our country um, is to vaccinate. Thank you.